Today we're going to talk about fluorescence. So I couldn't resist mixing a little blue, green, and red in the title. So what we're going to do is start with a kind of a brief review about what fluorescence is, and then start talking about how it got applied to the microscope. And you'll see up until sort of the mid 1950s, even the 1970s, fluorescence wasn't a big deal for the microscope. And it only sort of emerged later on, as you'll see with the emergence of confocal microscopy and super resolution and some of the techniques that we're going to talk about more related to the 21st century than even the 20th. So the history is, is kind of interesting. And so let's, let's sort of dig in. What I'm going to do is start with a very brief review just of the phenomenon of fluorescence, which I think you probably remember or have. And then I want to talk about, of all people, Curler. Curler is the man you know of that we haven't discussed at all, who developed the illumination system that is used in virtually all transmission microscopes, this thing called curler illumination. And we're not going to talk about that at all. But he was also involved in the development of an ultraviolet microscope, that is a microscope that used ultraviolet light. And that led to some very interesting things in terms of today's topic. Then we're going to come across in an interesting way, some work by a guy named Edward Land. He was the man who developed the Polaroid camera, the instant camera, which now is, is again an antique, but at the time was a remarkable thing in which you could take a picture, pull out a strip of paper that had chemicals embedded in it, and the picture would develop in about 60 seconds, sort of a remarkable thing. But for our purposes, we're going to come across a different set of materials that he was interested in. Land was, as I said, the, the founder of this company called Polaroid, based originally on the development of polarizing filters, Polaroid filters, which are now used all over in sunglasses. So he's a fascinating character. We're going to just look at one interesting little thing that he played around with. And then number four on this list is really the beginning of the revolution in the use of fluorescence for microscopy work. Because what Coombs did, as you'll see, was develop a way to label some proteins. And by labeling proteins with fluorescent dyes, suddenly the whole world exploded in terms of what you could do with, with fluorescence. And then we'll talk about a couple of ways that people have struggled at the beginning to do fluorescence microscopy through what was called, what is called transmitted illumination. And then we'll finally get to uh, Johann Plum, who developed and popularized the use of the filter cube optics that we use now. So that's the direction for the day. Let's see where we'll get started. It's kind of interesting. I mean, the term fluorescence was developed by uh, Stokes. And you've heard, I think, of something called the Stokes shift. And what Stokes shift was, was an analysis that said that when you illuminate a fluorescent material with a wavelength of light, some wavelength of light, when you illuminate that sample, the light that is emitted from the sample tends to be of longer wavelength than the light that you used to illuminate with to begin with, okay? And so, one of the interesting things was the way Stokes actually started doing this work. I mean, he used the light that he was using. This is in 1850 or so. So the light was sunlight. And what he did was he made solutions of various colors. Cupric hydroxide containing ammonia that, that made it a blue light. 
right? And filtered that onto a specimen. And what he got out, he then filtered again through a yellow filter, also a solution containing potassium dichromate, which is kind of a yellow uh, substance in a solution. And he saw the fluorescence by just looking at it. So what is going on? Well, there are, there are a couple of ways of illustrating fluorescence effects. One of them is this diagram called a Jablonski diagram, in which what you're basically looking at here is energy going from a base up high. And so the idea is that light is absorbed somewhere along this process. And as it is, so let's see if we can get some light entering here. It's not very clear, but when light enters this system, it kicks the energy of the components up. The end result of that is that actually, if you have in the old fashioned electron model, if you have electrons sitting in a shell at one level, that when they're irradiated with the light, they move up, they jump in an energy level like this. And that, that jump turns out to be unstable. So as soon as the light goes off, they jump back down again. When they jump back down again, they release the energy that they had captured. And that released energy comes out as light of one form or another. This diagram tries to point out that there are several levels of excitation that you can get to what are called singlet states and then uh, secondary states. Sometimes the fluorescence is delayed a little bit. Sometimes it happens immediately. And so there's all sorts of other variants, but the basic idea is that you're raising the energy and letting it release. It turns out, as I suggested, fluorescence had been identified in the mid 1850s or, or even more than that, but it was less interesting until, I mean, it was interesting to people who were studying rocks, right? Who were interested in the fluorescence of various types of crystals. But Perler, this is the Perler, remember, of Perler illumination, was working for Zeiss and trying to figure out what you could do once you reached the limit that Abe had calculated and showed them was absolutely the, the limit of resolution, which was dependent on the wavelength of light. And so what he did, and he worked with Rohr, who was a designer of lenses, to see if they could use shorter wavelengths of light instead of using even violet, dark violet in the spectrum, which was still around 4,000 or maybe a little bit less. They really weren't very, it was too, too weak and you didn't see anything. And so he was interested in whether or not you get, not, he wasn't interested initially in fluorescence. What he was interested in was, are there special absorbing properties of say biological material in the UV, would you be able to see something different and at higher resolution if you could use shortwave light instead of conventional visible light? Well, this leads to a lot of problems. The first of them is that most glass, the conventional glass, won't even transmit ultraviolet light. So right then and there, you've got a problem. And so you need to make special lenses out of quartz. And then it turns out quartz doesn't behave exactly as glass does in terms of the optical properties to generate lenses. So you have to recalculate, redesign the lenses entirely out of quartz. And so they did it. And here's a, a report from Curler having tried ultraviolet light. And so he's using stuff of a wavelength of 275. Some of you may remember that 280 is the absorption of some proteins. 
260 is the absorption of nucleic acids. And so you can, might be able to do something with it. And so this description I put up mostly for fun because it's kind of interesting that <clears throat> they're made out of crystal. They need to be corrected for spherical aberration. Okay, because they're still lenses, glass lenses, sort of. But chromatic aberration isn't a big issue because they're using a monochromatic light source. They were using the result of a, of a spark of a fixed wavelength. So it says here, for instance, magnesium light of 280 or cadmium light. Okay? But they point out two things that you do get fluorescence. And the fluorescence is injurious to the eye, but not only that, it mucks up the images that you're looking at. So, and the third thing, of course, is that you can't see this light. You can't see what you're getting. And so they did some elaborate work making a camera, here's the, where the camera film sits, to capture the images. And they said that you put this thing on a sort of a, you create something with a fluorescent screen that maybe you can see a little bit of with the ultraviolet light. And so they made this thing, but what they commented on in their papers, this is from 1904 or so, they said, you know, the problem though, is that when we use ultraviolet light, we induce fluorescence. And so that could be an issue, except that some people then got interested in the idea of actually trying to look at that fluorescence and see what they could see. One of the interesting ways that people played around with this, just because I'm fascinated by the subject, is that Edwin Land published his paper in Science in 1949, suggesting that you could change the wavelength by using a, a diffraction grading of the wavelength of the UV light that you were using. So UV is a large range of light. We talk about it in a spectrum. If you have a spectrum, right, a normal visible light spectrum in which you'd say this over here is 400, is um, sort of blue light. And over here you have red light at 700. Then all of this range from say 30, 350 down to 150 or something like that is all ultraviolet. And so what Land suggests is that maybe you could take different levels of ultraviolet light that would be absorbed differently and focus them on this camera. And then he got involved with saying, well, let's take a roll of film and pass this film across the objective of the microscope and pass it almost immediately into some solutions that that develop the film and then change the wavelength. So you change the wavelength, change the, the thing so that you end up with a series of say three separate pictures and you project those through a projector that has a red, green and, and blue light source so that you project the red image and the green image and the blue image so that you would end up with a colored image whose color was in some way derived from the ultraviolet light that was used to illuminate the sample. There are a couple of very weak images in the paper. They're not, and they're not in color. So it's not very helpful to see if it actually worked the way he suggested it. But the thing that I find most interesting about it among all this mechanical stuff, the illumination is done through the bottom of the microscope by transmitted light. And that's what people ended up doing quite a bit of, which was to set up a microscope in which 
you'd have a very bright light source. And then you'd have some sort of filter to block out most of the light that was going through, except for the wavelength you cared about. And then that would go up to your sample. And if your sample fluoresced a different color, then you'd have a separate filter over here to block out whatever was left of this illuminating light, the ultraviolet in most cases. Well, some people figured out a way of cheating, which was to use what we now think of as a dark field condenser. I haven't spent much time or any time on dark field yet, but the idea is that if your condenser drives light at an angle through the sample like this, okay, that what happens is it goes through the sample, but it never gets into the lens. And the only thing that gets into the lens is the light that's emitted from your sample. So if your sample was, say, emitting fluorescence, the fluorescent light might go into the eye, into the lens. Okay. But these are both techniques that absorb enormous amounts of light. Either the filters, I, I actually used scopes like this at one point, and the filter that you use for the light was, you know, an eighth inch to a quarter inch thick piece of blue glass so that only, only that light would go through. So you, you do the entire operation in a sealed off dark room. If you took pictures, exposures were very, very long. It was very hard to judge whether you were in focus or not. This was a very difficult operation. Although if you wanted to do it, that was the way you could. In 1941, Albert Coombs, who was a chemist as well as a physician, took a vacation. He went to Europe in 1939. And while on vacation, this idea came to him. He said, you know, we're just learning now about the existence of antibodies. A lot of antibody science, of course, still remained to be discovered. But there was an awareness that there was antibody molecules which reacted specifically with the antigens that were in the body. And he thought, gee, wouldn't it be useful to be able to identify where these antibodies actually are? And so he developed a technique for making these antibodies fluorescent by combining them with fluorescein. Fluorescein had been identified early as just a fluorescent compound. And he figured out a way of taking fluorescein and binding it to an antibody. So now the idea was you were able to take what we now think of as an antibody molecule, old friendly antibody, and bind to it this fluorescein molecule. And then react that with a tissue. You have a tissue that has um, something in it that you care about. And this substance, you can't see normally, but it's there. If you could get antibodies to bind to it, like this, then you might be able to locate this material within the tissue that you care about. So then it turns out there's a little problem, which is that fluorescein is activated not by ultraviolet light, but by deep blue light. Okay, so you couldn't use these old fashioned techniques of just eliminating the ultraviolet. Here you had to do something like this, which is to filter out the light that wasn't the green and wasn't red just to allow blue light to go through or to play this game with a dark field condenser. Different microscope companies use different strategies, but in all cases, they were rather difficult. Well, one approach, one approach was in fact, not to use light transmitted through the objective lens, 
but to use light somehow transmitted through the objective. So let's design a microscope now, simple microscope, if you will. I'm gonna shine a light here, put a filter or a mirror over here. And I'm going to reflect this light down through the objective lens. Okay, that's the objective lens. Well, the objective lens on the microscope is much stronger than the condenser lenses. So that you would assume that what you can do is create this spot that's much brighter on the sample. The problem is then, if this sample is fluorescent, so here's your sample, and if it's fluorescent, it's sending light back up here. Now, what do you do, okay? In the earliest models, what you do is you make this mirror semi-transparent so that some of that light goes through like this, but it's still going to be contaminated with the exciting light. And so you would put another filter in here. But this is still very awkward because you waste a lot of light. Well, in the 1950s, in the 1952, it was published in the Soviet Union by Rumberg and Krilova. They developed what is now known as a dichroic filter, but because it was 1952, the information never got out of the Soviet Union. And so, Quite a bit later, a man by the name of Johann Plum developed the same system, basically, in which he started working this time to work with the shot group from Zeiss initially to make these filters. As it turns out, the device he made was actually marketed initially by, uh, by another microscope company, by Leica who were uh, able to capture what he had in mind. But let me sort of, sort of show you an example of how a dichroic filter works, okay? So this is a short video. And what he's doing, so just so that you understand the story is, he's starting by showing you that if you illuminate, let's say the paper underneath these filters, then, you get a certain color going through. But if you reflect, so let me draw this filter here. Here's a filter. And what turns out to be interesting here is that if you shine light through this filter, this way, it actually all goes through pretty much. So the filter looks transparent. On the other hand, if you reflect some light off it, then only certain wavelengths are reflected and you see a very different color. The other wavelengths are absorbed by the filter. So let's see what the video shows. two dichroic glass lenses, and three dichroic mirrors. The color you see is the light which has passed through the glass, reflected off the white material, and then bounced back to your eyes. You can see that under indirect lighting, the colors of each sheet of glass changes. This is because the light is no longer passing through the glass. It is just reflecting off of that dichroic surface. Well, I hope that's clearer than my diagram. It may not be. But the basic idea is that these pieces of glass are treated in such a way that certain wavelengths, now let me draw a sort of a large cross section through the glass. And we'll take a large wavelength of some form or other, okay? It hits the surface of the glass and some of it is reflected off. 
but some of it enters the filter, the glass, bounces off the back, okay? And some of it, as you see, ends up being reinforced. So when it's reinforced, this becomes an even stronger reflection. But if you have other wavelengths and light in here that also come in, they may reflect off. Let's reflect one off. But the corresponding one is out of alignment. And so it doesn't show up, okay? So that you end up with one wavelength going, being reflected by the glass, the other transmitted by it. So this was converted into this system using the objective lens. This is a pretty reasonable diagram of it, suggesting this, that you take light, um, let's start with blue light, whatever color that is, okay? It actually goes through a blue filter, so it stays blue. It hits this dichroic mirror. Now, it actually goes both through the mirror, but mostly is reflected down to the sample. Okay. Now, if you have a fluorescent sample down here, why my fluorescent sample is black, I don't know, but I'm gonna make it black. But it emits, let's say red light. The red light goes back into the system, but because of the nature of the filter, instead of being reflected, it goes right through the filter and you see the result of it. You see it as emission. So that's the basic idea. Plume figured out what combination of these filters could be used for different wavelength pairs. And so he ended up creating for Leica originally, what was actually given the name, which is sort of cute, of a plume pack. Okay. And the plume pack is, the, is a set of cubes. It's a set of cubes of different wavelengths pairs so that you could actually take different materials stained with different chromophores, different fluorophores, and look at one after another by simply changing the position of this cube. And let's see if I can show it to you. So here's an example of a modern microscope that has a set, a turret here, in which there are several of these cubes. Okay. And the, the animation, which I'll show you, there are adjustments on the microscope that I'm going to just leave wide open for the moment and even keep the intensity all the way up to what it's worth. Now, this control, the slider, controls the position of this cube. And so it starts with a cube, it says here, that illuminates at 360. Well, you can't really see the 360 because it's in the ultraviolet, but you can see blue fluorescence that comes up, okay? Now, if I rotate this, Okay, now I've rotated it so that we now have a cube that reflects blue light and transmits green light back up. Okay, 
Now let's try another one. Okay, so 550 is this kind of greenish light. And what is emerging from a sample, if it has the right fluorophore in it, is yellow. And so once again, the yellow goes to your eyepiece, eye, to your eyepieces, to your eyes, while the other color is directed down to the sample. And you get that fluorescence. Notice that what they're showing is that the light itself, this light, is always the same, right? They're not changing this light that comes from the light source. They're just selecting certain wavelengths from it. So we're going to rotate one more notch, okay? And we get something even more in the, uh, in the greenish and we get a slightly longer wavelength. If we go to something that's really red, now we start getting emission in a funny color, which is beyond the, the long wavelength that you have. Um, and so they don't know what color to make it. In fluorescence images, very often this very long wavelength light is colored blue, which is very confusing because you sometimes have blue from the short wavelength. Anyway, this is the idea of this design for a microscope. Now, in the animation, you can tell that what's missing is that these turrets don't rotate which they do in a real microscope. So you actually have a set in here, normally, of a number of turrets, a number of cubes. So you would have a turret, and I'm gonna look down on the turret. So the turret will be this big circular object. And it has within it a series of these cubes. Okay, and um, you know, each cube is for a different color. Then what you can do, let's see if I can do it in the animation. Okay, is rotate the whole business and change the cube that I'm using for my sample. So that's the idea. Now, in, in getting this lecture together and talking about some of this material, I decided to look up a little bit more about Johann Plum. A couple of interesting points. First of all, his middle name is Sebastian. So maybe that tells you something about his family of origin has this idea of Johann Sebastian, no, not Plum, not Bach, but Plum. Anyway, he was born in, um, in Sumatra, which was at that time a Dutch colony. Uh, and then they moved to Holland at some point. Turns out, if you read his biography, his biography tends to emphasize his interest in painting and art, and then to pick up his science. So his science, led him to this idea of the filters of different colors. And that has made a full career for himself. But they make a real point out of something he's been doing in digital art. And the best I could do to come up with an example of it is this one picture, which is actually a medieval painting that he has somehow transformed by mapping certain colors to certain intensities. At least that's what I understand of it. And so apparently he's created this stuff. It was shown at various art, art festivals, but I, as I said, I really have found only one or two examples of these interesting kinds of pictures. There's another point, which is that he is still alive. He's about 97 now but he is apparently still active. He has a position at the University of Leiden, Leiden 
in Holland. But it is sort of odd if you go to his website, this array of material is what you see. It's very hokey looking. Um, I'm not sure what's behind it, except that there's a certain humor that I think may be behind some of this stuff. It's just a very odd collection of ways to generate links, not our normal website. Um, I'll put a link to it in the notes for this class in case you want to follow up some more of it, okay? So I thought after all this talk about fluorescence, I might show you at least a couple of pictures of what when people are now able to do. So what we have here, for instance, a couple of cells stained with one dye, which is excited by wavelength 568 in the green, which means it fluoresces in the red. And that turns out to be tubulin in, this, in these cells, okay? This is done by combining antibodies with the label to the protein or combining the floor itself directly to the table, to the tubulin. It's not clear which is the case in these images. Another one, which was a 350, that means it was excited in the 350 range. And so fluoresces blue. That stains this material, these patterns here, which are phalloidin. Phalloidin stains actin filaments. And then cytox green stains the nucleus of these cells. In this one, there are basically two dyes that are used. One of them is for the nucleus, and that's a, a substance which by its nature binds to DNA and fluoresces by itself. It's a fluorescent compound and just happens to bind to DNA, okay? So it lights up, if you will, the nucleus, whereas the tubulin that's in here is lit, is, is bound to um, rhodamine, or it's probably antibody to rhodamine, to tubulin based on with a rhodamine dye on it. And so this cell type has obviously got a very different type of tubulin array than say this one. One or two more and then we'll call it a day. In this image, we obviously, we have something that is picking up the, nu the nuclear protein, which is alexafluor coupled to this model, molecule called NCPC, okay? It's a nuclear pore or nuclear compound. There's another reagent, which is coupled to antibody directed against the protein called, um, called giantin. And giantin is a component of the Golgi apparatus. Remember the Golgi apparatus and the fact that people weren't able to decide what its true structure was. Fluorescence images like this really, really bring out the structure of the Golgi apparatus. And then once again, phalloidin is used to indicate where the microfilaments, the actin filaments are within these spread cells. Okay. And then one more, wow, right? In which there are basically two types of label, one of which is that nuclear label that we saw earlier. And the other is an antibody coupled to a protein called ZO3, okay? ZO3, as it turns out, is zonula occludens. And what you're seeing is a surprise in that this protein, which is isolated from zonula occludens in a tissue culture environment. This is a tissue culture cell. There are just a layer of cells. Um, they are surrounded by this zonula occludens protein. 
So this protein more or less surrounds each cell. The question you might ask is, wait a minute, what's going on over here? Right? And the idea may very well be that you've got one cell overlapping another one. And so its membrane surface, sonial occludens, shows up very strongly on top of the nucleus of a cell that's underneath. Sort of a remarkable image. Okay, that's basically what I wanted to share with you about this part of fluorescence. In the next lecture, I wanna talk about what's become the dominant way that people are using fluorescence, which is to use molecular techniques to label proteins specifically, okay?